Anthony Harriot points out that, and I quote, only a few developing countries experience violence with such intensity, end of quote, as Jamaica. He identifies only two other countries with such high intensity violence, South Africa and Colombia. Jamaica is number one in the world in sprints. We're in the top three in the world in netball. And regrettably, we're also in the top three in the world in violence. This poses a serious dilemma for us as a people. Not much empirical work has been undertaken by researchers and academics to determine the extent to which sport participation can help to reduce crime. Empirical work in this area is much needed. There are, however, some observations which can be made. Sport enjoys a special place in all communities. Sport is also an agent of peace building. It has been used by many countries to reduce hostility and tension. No different here in Jamaica. One such example was cited by former Prime Minister Edward Seaga, and I quote, in Jamaica, quoting Mr. Seaga, we have the interesting example of two communities, Arnett Gardens and Tivoli Gardens, that were virtually at war for 20 years. And when I say at war, I mean at war, with numerous deaths and wounding. Residents could not enter the opposing community. This continued for 20 years, continued Mr. Seaga, until the member of parliament for that community Omar Davis got together with me. He was the finance minister at the time. We were the parliamentary representatives of these two adjoining communities. And he suggested that we stage a game of football to herald the new stadium which had been built in the area. I led my team there and peace was restored, end of quote. There are certain critical factors which must be pointed out why sport, in this instance, could have been used as an instrument of bringing hosti hostile forces together. One, it required a non-partisan approach. The opening of the new stadium was the center to which both teams were invited. The existence of proper facilities in our communities is critical in using sport as a vehicle to bring communities together and by extension suppressing, if not eradicating hostilities and among them. There must be strong and mature leadership in the respective communities. It can be assumed Assume, ladies and gentlemen, that many of those persons who were involved in the 20-year war of which Mr. Seaga spoke were also involved in either the organization of the football match or were in attendance at the match or a combination of both. Yet none, not one, was arrested or taken before the courts during or after the match. Clearly, in using sport to bring about peace and reduce tension, the state and its agents, particularly security forces, have to forgive and forget past wrongs in the interests of the greater good. And next, while the football match was the catalyst in breaking down the war between the two communities, it was not able to eradicate violence completely within the communities, as the zones in which these communities are located are still violence-prone areas. And the ending of the war is one issue. The sustainability of the peace is another. Sport can be used to bridge the relationship between the police and the youth who would otherwise engage in anti-social activities. The establishment, for example, of police youth clubs by the Jamaica Constabulary Force across the country, using sports as a means of attracting our youth, is an attempt to develop a structured relationship between the police and the young people. I now turn to another area, sport and education. The most challenging social issue, in my view, in Jamaica today is the state of our education system. Fix the system of education and the country will be well on its way to addressing a number of social issues. <laughs> Every year, there are approximately 55,000 students who sit the Caribbean Examinations Council's examinations. Of this number, only about 20% have the requisite qualifications for meaningful employment and or entry to post-secondary programs. In other words, low levels of vocational skills, social skills, literacy and numeracy render each year 44,000 of those leaving the secondary system virtually unemployable or ineligible for further education or training. If 80% of our secondary students upon leaving their respective institutions are virtually unemployable and untrainable. It simply means 
by crude extrapolation that the majority of the youth representing our country in the various sports are also virtually unemployable and ineligible for further education and training. Our major sports organizations are required to pay more attention to this challenge among our sport representatives. In this regard, I am mindful of the J3A's intervention program, which seeks to assist student athletes who may need academic intervention in terms of their schoolwork. The decision by ISO that a student must attain a minimum of four grades of 45% or above in the term preceding participation in the Manning and the Costa Cup competitions is a commendable one. I go further. I would wish to see this rule extended to all sport, not just schoolboy football. However, there's an anomaly which must be corrected. There are some schools which require a student to have an average of 50% if that student is to participate in his or her graduation sermon. This two-tiered system is sending a mixed signal, and I'm appealing to ISO and the JTA to work towards a standardization of the benchmark as what will happen is that while a student is academically qualified to represent his or her school on, in football or any other sport, he or she might not be academically qualified to be part of the graduating ceremony. By not affording the vast majority of our young sportsmen and women a decent education, we expose them and the country to the danger of embarrassment when they are thrust on the national and international stage, barely able to deliver themselves in an intelligible form, particularly when they are asked to do an interview. Many of them hide this fact by trying to speak with an accent. <laughs> Listen, and you will hear. It is a way of trying to overcome a defect caused by an education, educational system which is in deep crisis. Also, many of them are unable to help themselves when their playing days are over because their lack of education afforded them only one option and that was to be engaged in one sport or another and nothing else. We owe it to our country and by extension to our sport representatives and potential representatives to fix our formal education system. I now turn to sport and nation building. For nearly 100 years, sport in Jamaica has been an important component of nation building. In order to enhance sport as a critical ingredient in nation building, the provision of the necessary infrastructure is important. In this regard, there are seven critical interventions by the state over the years which I wish to point out. First, the building of the National Stadium in 1962. Second, the decision by the government in 1977 to have the Cuban government build what is now the G.C. Foster College of Physical Education and Sport in St. Catherine which was opened in 1980. The Institute of Sport, which was established in April 1978. The establishment of the Sports Development Foundation in 1995, and the Culture, Health, Arts, Sports, and Education Fund, known as the Chase Fund, which was created in 2002 and under which the SDF is now subsumed. As a result of the collaboration between the SDF and Chase through the there has been allotted approximately 400 million Jamaican dollars for sports this particular year. Next, the reconstruction in 2007 of Sabina Park and the construction of the Trelawney Stadium, which is intended to be the first phase of the Trelawney multipurpose complex. The San Jose Accord, which is an agreement that was forged between the governments of Venezuela and Jamaica, under which 20% of Jamaica's oil payments to that country would be reserved for the development of Jamaica's sport and cultural facilities. And the establishment in the late 1970s of a national council on sport, chaired by the Prime Minister. The contributions of the private sector and the voluntary sector have been critical. In, in information gleaned from 35 of the leading private sector sport sponsoring companies in Jamaica, as well as a summary of the amounts donated by companies towards sponsoring of sport events as reported in the press, printed press for the year 2009, it is estimated that approximately 500 million Jamaican dollars was allocated in that year by the private sector to sports. This amount does not include the value of sponsorship given by media entities, 
as well as sponsorship given by numerous small businesses and individuals. The army of volunteers from the early childhood, primary, secondary, and tertiary level institutions, those involved in community organizations, as well as national organizations, have significantly contributed to the building of the nation through sport.